Can we go ahead and start? Or? I think so. I think uh, now's a good time to begin. Okay. Well, I'm just going to say, uh, talk for about 10 seconds. I'm Bob Lee. I'm the editor of the People's Tribune. I want to welcome everybody. Um, we're going to have a, a very good panel. And uh, basically, I just at this point wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this meeting and uh, we're going to uh, record the remarks of the panelists and we'll be posting those online uh, at a future date. And with that, I'll just uh, turn it over to Pedro so we can get started. Thank you, Bob, and, and thank you, Laura, uh, both of whom have been uh, the, uh, the pioneers in, in developing the initial idea of having a delegation of activists, researchers, and independent journalists sponsored by the Chicago-based El Tribuno del Pueblo, or the People's Tribune, uh, for a people-to-people fact-finding uh, mission, a delegation to the U.S.-Mexico border. Unfortunately, because of the uh, pandemic, um, we, it, you know, we, we were sidelined a bit, but we got creative and the idea uh, was to host a series of panels from now or from before leading up towards the elections for uh, us to hear directly from people who live, who work, who uh, make their lives possible along the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Uh, and then this way offering an opportunity to expand uh, what uh, the teachings that, that our presenters will have to offer for uh, everyone who has an opportunity to hear from them. Um, the idea will be that from uh, these presentations, and this is the third one in a series of about five, uh, will be to develop a report that will then be used to submit to uh, elected officials, to uh, other international bodies with the idea of being able to expand and uh, present uh, those voices from the borderlands. And so um, it's a, been so far a diverse uh, group of people who have participated in the panels and who have presented and uh, all of them have, have been fantastic and we have a great um, list of presenters uh, tonight, uh, which I'll introduce in, in a little bit. Um, so the, the, this third 90 minute, um, what we are calling Zooming to the Border for Human Rights, uh, will focus on the impact of uh, border wall in borderland communities responses and proposals for dignity and self-determination uh, because we know that we can outline and highlight the problematic nature of uh, border walls but we also i think it's important to learn about how communities resist it's important to hear how communities are resilient in spite of such atrocities that we are seeing in our communities and it's important to take those voices and present them to uh, people who are not along the border and uh, don't get to hear directly from impacted communities. So um, as we're going along, I will uh, invite you to uh, place questions in the chat. Please remember to keep yourself muted uh, with the exception of our uh, speakers uh, who will present. Um, so I wanted to just briefly uh, mention a little bit of the framing around militarization. When we talk about border wall construction, we can go back all the way to the Eisenhower years of different types of, of border wall infrastructure that was placed along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, the more uh, contemporary time period, the past 40 years, 40 years for instance, with uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, Tortilla Curtain, if you're familiar with that, was a, um, in 1977 and 1978, uh, the placement of uh, about six miles of, uh, of, wasn't border wall, this was like a fence with barbed wire, and that created what was known as the Tortilla Curtain, which was reminiscent of the Iron Curtain of the, of the Cold War. Um, going into the 90s with the implementation of various operations like Gatekeeper in uh, San Diego, um, Hold the Line in, in El Paso, these uh, were meant to beef up uh, enforcement along the borderlands with the idea that it would create uh, territorial denial or at that point, what was known as uh, prevention through deterrence. And that prevention through deterrence not only included uh, an increase of border agents, but also incre an increase in infrastructure, including border wall. Um, at this moment, uh, as of September 4th of this year, so as of two weeks ago, there are approximately about 689 miles of border wall uh, that have been installed. This represents about 35% of the current 
a stretch of, of, of border between the US and Mexico, which is approximately about 1,954 miles. Uh, to just break that down a little bit more, and that's roughly at a cost of about $24.4 million per mile. So uh, since Trump took office, uh, there have been an additional 317 miles of border wall. Now, um, this includes eight miles of new primary border wall. So if you're standing in Mexico, looking into the US, that's the primary border wall. So eight miles of new primary border wall, about 27 miles of new secondary wall, and the, the remainder, 282 miles of replacement wall, meaning that that replacement wall uh, replaced infrastructure that was already in, in place that predates the Trump era. So it includes the Normandy style fencing. These are like X's that we, um, in California, we might see this as, a, as we're driving from San Diego uh, County to Imperial County, these uh, X's that are along the border. Uh, pedestrian style fence, uh, old um, uh, corrugated uh, steel mats that were placed during the uh, Bush father and Clinton years, and other sorts of vehicle barriers. Um, and so I just wanted to provide that framework so um, we kind of have a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, for our presenters today, the, the two main questions that I wanted for us to interrogate are, um, the first one would be to describe how border wall construction has impacted your community or your area of work and any short-term or long-term challenges that that has created. And then secondly, how has your community responded? How has your community resisted? In the second question, the idea is uh, to look at how we uphold our dignity in, in, in the face of some abject um, terror that border walls uh, create, especially because they funnel people to cross through very dangerous, treacherous terrain like the mountains and deserts that have caused a human rights disaster along the borderlands with uh, close to 10,000 people that have died uh, over the past 25 years, 26 years now, uh, when Operation Gatekeeper was put in place. And then also what does self-determination look like as your community is confronting uh, the madness of these border walls? So those are the, the two kind of uh, sets of questions that I'm hoping that our panelists will uh, interrogate with uh, within a short <laughs> seven to ten minute uh, uh, presentation and then after our panelists uh, present uh, we'll have time for for Q&A. Um, so our, our first uh, uh, speaker is Norma Herrera. Norma is from the uh, Rio Grande Valley of, of Texas. Uh, she was born in Tamaulipas, Mexico and grew up in the Rio Grande Valley. She coordinates a grassroots coalition working to stop border wall construction in the RGV and supports efforts to free people from ICE detention. Her work includes building a base of directly impacted communities to organize against punitive government policies that cause harm and criminalize migration. Uh, so Norma, you're going to be our first speaker. Uh, thank you. Um, before, before you go, I just want to reiterate my appreciation for all of you. I know you're all very busy. So thank you so much for agreeing to be panelists today and thank uh, all of you for joining this important conversation. So Norma, you're, you're up, please take it away. Thank you, Pedro. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to be on the call today. I've been having some internet connection issues this week, so I will turn off uh, the video today just to ensure that you can actually hear me. Um, and just give me a second so I can share my screen. Okay, so again, my name is Norma. I work for the Equal Voice Network. And uh, today, oops, sorry about that. Uh, today I will talk about some of the impacts of walls in the so-called Rio Grande Valley, including on uh, democratic processes and community decision-making, on the preservation of historic indigenous and environmental sites, on flooding in the area, on access to the Rio Grande River, and on our constitutional right to equal protection under the law. Um, so to start with, even where there are examples of Congress trying to carve out exemptions 
to border wall construction or require consultation with frontline communities about border walls, Customs and Border Protection has continued to ignore us. So in the fiscal year 2019 appropriations bill, uh, Congress required quote unquote consultation with towns in Star County about the alignment and design of the border wall. So these towns included Roma, Escobares, La Grulla, Rio Grande City, and Salineño. Local officials and CBP were in conversations about the alignment of the wall, and the government was also collecting public comments about the effects of these walls in these areas. My apologies, let me go back. Um, and then Customs and Border Protection issued a contract on March 2nd for 15 miles of wall in these five towns. So Star County officials thought they were still in consultation with CBP and they were essentially blindsided. CBP had received 2,566 public comments, which expressed concerns about everything from the wall's impact on wildlife and habitat, flooding, historical sites and tribal lands, property devaluation, cost of construction, and humanitarian concerns, to name just a few. And then on April 30th, the government published its response to these comments and essentially just brushed them all aside, brushed all these concerns aside and indicated that they would continue with the same plans that they had before the consultation. So the process was clearly just for show and the voices of local, local communities were not heard. Congress has also prohibited border wall construction um, within historic cemeteries in fiscal year 2020 appropriations. The Eli Jackson Cemetery, which um, is just behind um, the area in this, in this picture, contains remains of Carrizo Comecrudo tribe members. Uh, the Carrizo Comecrudo are the original people of the so-called Rio Grande Valley. And uh, this area was the site of Yalui Village, which is what you're looking at in this picture. This is where the tribe camped out for a year to impede border wall construction. So right next to this area is Jackson Ranch Church, which is the oldest Protestant church in South Texas. And that site also includes a historic cemetery. The church and cemeteries are part of a ranching settlement founded in 1857 by Nathaniel Jackson and Matilda Hicks, a former slave. So this area served as a stop along the Underground Railroad and the Jackson's house escaped slaves and helped ferry them across the river to Mexico where slavery had been abolished and they could live free. So even though uh, they're not building within the cemeteries like Congress prohibited, the wall's 150 foot enforcement zone may still cut into these sites and because they'll be stranded south of the wall, they may still be inaccessible to indigenous and local communities. And so very quickly, because it's gonna come up again, the enforcement zone is on a 150 foot area consisting of all weather roads, lighting towers, cameras, and other surveillance technology. A CBP official told the Ramirez family who are descendants of Nathaniel and Matilda that the government was considering a reduced enforcement zone in, in this area of the cemeteries, um, but nothing official has been confirmed uh, and it's, quite possible uh, that they'll um, still end up, that it'll still end up cutting into the cemeteries and construction ultimately may still unearth grave sites with no headstones or markers while they're, um, while they're building. So construction has now started and uh, a member of our local No Border Wall Coalition who is also a member of the Carrizo Comecrudo tribe uh, took these images a couple of days ago. Um, and so you can see uh, Southwest Valley construction has already broken ground on this field uh, that sits just east of Eli Jackson and Jackson Ranch. And the survey marker there in the middle is right next to Eli Jackson, where, uh, which you can see off in the back of uh, the picture on the right hand side. And uh, just minutes before this call, I learned that a federal judge today signed a temporary restraining order forcing Southwest Valley constructors to stop construction 100 feet from the cemetery. And so they'll schedule a hearing and hopefully that will indefinitely stop construction. So in the fiscal year 2019 appropriations, Congress exempted five locations in the Valley from border walls in response to large demonstrations and community mobilizations 
to protect these historic and environmentally sensitive sites. So these include uh, certain tracts of the Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge, uh, La Lomita, which is a 19th century Catholic chapel, Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park, the National Butterfly Center, and the Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge. So here again, we are seeing CBP defy the intent of Congress. So there's a privately owned levy, a third of a mile long, that has a common boundary with Santa Ana. And because it's technically privately owned, the government still plans to build a border wall on it. So that means that the 150 foot enforcement zone around the wall, which again involves complete clearing of the land, this will cut into the refuge. So border wall construction will still negatively affect Santa Ana, despite the clear intent of Congress to protect it. Additionally, in response to requests for comments, the US Fish and Wildlife Service told CBP last summer that the planned border barrier construction, this is a direct quote, will negatively impact approximately 30% of Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge tracts. These tracts will become unavailable and make the long-term goal of providing contiguous forested areas along the Rio Grande of South Texas for wildlife breeding birds and ocelots and jaguarundis no longer feasible. So this image here is of an ocelot, which is an endangered wild cat native to the region, and it depends on habitat provided by the Lower Rio Grande Valley National Wildlife Refuge. According to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the recovery plan for this species includes connecting the populations in Texas and Mexico to provide a migratory corridor. So this project will obviously be made that much more difficult by a border wall disrupting ocelot migration routes. Building on the Rio Grande floodplain uh, will mean serious flooding for colonias on the wall's path. So when the Rio Grande River floods naturally at certain times of the year, border walls act like dams. They clog up debris and vegetation and prevent the natural flow of floodwaters. So this means that communities on both sides of the border here and in Mexico face the risk of catastrophic flooding. According to reporting by the Texas Observer, half of the 64 miles of border walls planned for Star County will be in the floodplain. So many of uh, these border wall miles will go through colonias, uh, which, which are these little settlements outside of city limits that already struggle with bad drainage infrastructure. So these colonias have low income residents and serious flooding could be devastating to their quality of life. And in the worst case scenario, catastrophic flooding could lead to preventable deaths. Border walls will also severely limit access to the Rio Grande River for border residents and wildlife. So there are a few towns that uh, will be affected that I wanted to highlight today. Um, so Salineño is a riverside town where residents use the river recreationally. It's particularly treasured uh, birding spot uh, and the Salineño Preserve is, is known internationally for bird species that are unique to the area and really found nowhere else uh, in the so-called United States. The preserve will unfortunately be cut in half and one half of it will remain south of the wall. The town itself, which has historically used uh, the river recreationally, will be cut off from the Rio Grande and the government has not really guaranteed uh, that the public will retain access to the river. And uh, this image here is of the riverfront home of Naida Alvarez, uh, which is a member of the local No Border Walk Coalition. Um, and so the, the government is currently trying to sue her um, to build the wall on her property and that will limit her ability to enjoy um, this beautiful uh, view of the river that you see here. And then there's Los Ebanos. So this picture here is of Aleda Garza's riverfront uh, property. Uh, on this day, uh, the No Border Wall Coalition, uh, we went door knocking in Los Ebanos to talk to the residents about the border wall. And we stopped in this spot because we were planning a, a community event that would lead folks down into the river. And so we were like scoping out the spot. And we ran into this family fishing and using the river recreationally. Uh, and it was interesting, we had this long conversation about whether the wall was necessary or not. And this family uh, that's here in the picture, although some of them were immigrants, 
Uh, some of them believed that the wall was necessary to stop migrants from entering the U.S. So ironically, if the wall had been built, they would not have access to the very spot they were standing on. Um, and so I know we're, we're here to talk about the impact of, of our oppressive government, but I just wanted to recognize that sometimes the oppression lives in our very own community, and sometimes that's when it's hardest to confront. So waiving of laws. So the Real ID Act, uh, which was passed in 2005 in the aftermath of 9-11 and during the so-called war on terror, uh, this gives the federal government the authority to waive all federal laws in the interest of quote unquote national security. Uh, and I'm putting that in quotes because I, I think a lot of us know ensuring national security is kind of a made up standard that really only applies to things that threaten the white power structure. So Bush and Trump have used this authority in order to expedite border wall construction. And when Trump waives protections like the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, this means that border wall construction is happening without environmental impact reviews. Because border walls don't comply with NEPA, the, gov the government essentially just makes stuff up as they go along and they provide insincere responses to concerns that are submitted by the public. And this process really allows uh, no room for the community to truly be heard. Again, because border walls don't comply uh, with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, Trump is actively blasting native burial sites across the southern border, including in Tohono O'odham lands in so-called Arizona, which I think other folks on this call can speak to better than I can. So what this means in effect is that border communities are facing an assault on our constitutional right to equal protection under the law which is the argument behind a recent lawsuit brought forth by nearby Zapata County uh, that's close to the valley and two border landowners in Texas. And this here is just a sampling of all the laws waived to build border walls, but there are many more. And lastly, if I can speak briefly for community resistance here in the valley, uh, work that has been led by many other folks in this area, in the last few years, there have been mass mobilizations to protect Santa Ana, La Lomita Chapel, Benson State Park, and the National Butterfly Center, which is what forced Congress's hand and led to these areas being exempted from construction in the first place. So in this image here, folks are lined up along the route of the proposed wall at Santa Ana. Uh, and this would have bisected, the wall here would have bisected the refuge and left half of it south of the wall. The Carrizo Come Crudo, again, the original people of the so-called Rio Grande Valley, created Yalui Village and put their bodies on the line at the site of Eli Jackson Cemetery, which is what, along with advocacy from families with ties to these cemeteries, again, forced Congress to exempt them. And it's them continuing to fight that's really led to this temporary uh, restraining order that was just announced today. So along with protests and demonstrations before the pandemic, the local coalition was also canvassing in towns on the wall's path, as you saw. And we were informing residents of the right to sue the government and slow down the process of having their land seized, as well as connect them to pro bono legal resources. A key part of our strategy has been to slow down construction as much as possible in the lead up to the presidential election. And right now we're planning a funeral procession from a staging site to the site of construction uh, near Eli Jackson and Jackson Ranch. Um, our region has been hit really hard by the pandemic and we want to highlight the alarming rate of COVID-19 related deaths here in the Valley and the absolute absurdity of wasting money on useless steel and concrete instead of life-saving resources. So for us, uh, self-determination means telling our stories, shaping our own narratives, supporting indigenous communities in their fight to protect their ancestral lands, and using creative action to compel elected officials to serve our interests and not those of a racist, xenophobic administration. Thank you for your time today. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Norma. Very enlightening. I think um, there's a lot there. It's very difficult, I think, to cover the impact of <clears throat> border wall and um, within the, the short time period that we have, but definitely a window into how that resistance is taking place. And, and just to highlight in terms of the waiver authority, and, and I'm sure maybe a few others will speak on this, that that waiver authority, um, which was, uh, has empowered the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security to waive over 30 or so laws and so forth, um, has been um, put into place 30 times. 
uh, six times uh, or five times by uh, Bush son and, and 25 times by, um, by Trump. And so it just goes to show that how much of a reach uh, of an authority uh, by an unelected official and the impact that it has to local communities. So um, to continue, I'd like to ask uh, Lakin uh, Jordel, who is a Borderlands campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity. He works to protect wildlife, ecosystems, and communities throughout the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and draw attention to the cost of border wall construction and border militarization. Before joining the center, Lakin worked with the National Park Service studying threats to wilderness character throughout the Rocky Mountain West including Big Bend National Park and Oregon Pipe National Monument. He's also worked as a backcountry trail builder, a clan farmer, and a legislative fellow in the U.S. House of Representatives. And if you have an opportunity to follow Lakin, uh, very, uh, um, very, very intuitive uh, information and, and um, informational uh, stuff that he puts out on, on Twitter. So definitely uh, give him a follow. So Lakin, uh, please uh, present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. It's such an honor to be here with uh, colleagues and Compass across the so-called U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Um, I'm going to give you a little snapshot of what we're seeing in Arizona, um, and I'm going to share my screen to show some photos while I do that. Um, big time solidarity to you, Norma, and RGB. I hope to make it back down there soon to see you. Um, yeah, so I am based in Tucson, occupied Autumn homelands. Um, and actually, before I started my job with the Center for Biological Diversity, I worked at Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which has become one of the biggest flashpoints in terms of wall construction uh, in the struggle against wall construction. Um, my job for the Park Service was assessing the biggest threats to wilderness, uh, the biggest threats to the environment, to wildlife in this area. Um, and by some stroke of, of luck, uh, bad luck, I guess, I got the job uh, two weeks before Trump took office and was inaugurated. Um, at this time, I was told by my bosses at the monument not to write about the border wall, uh, which was just unbelievable to me because the single biggest threat to this area was the threat of wall construction, was the threat of, of having this peaceful national monument and wilderness area turned into an industrial construction zone, blasted with floodlights, drained of groundwater. Um, and that was my last term with the Park Service. <laughs> I quit my job with the Park Service. Um, and I joined the Center for Biological Diversity, where I've been able to uh, act actively advocate um, and, and talk about the impacts of wall construction without having to be uh, censored by the administration. Um, so when I worked at Oregon Pipe, uh, this is what the border looked like. And up until about a year ago, this is what the physical border at Oregon Pipe uh, looked like. And as you can see, these small barriers, they're called vehicle barriers, um, as Pedro mentioned earlier, um, they're completely permeable to wildlife. Wildlife can pass over or under. People could jump right over or under these barriers as well. Um, up until this year, most of the Arizona border and a lot of the borderlands um, had this kind of barrier uh, along the physical border. Um, now, if you go to this exact same location, this is what you'll see. Um, and this is a solid 30-foot concrete and steel border wall that rips the landscape in two. Um, and as you can see, it's not just the wall, but they've bulldozed this massive swath of land. And this is, this is Optum land full of artifacts and archaeological sites. This is land that did not have any archaeological surveys done before all this destruction ensued. And again, this is happening in a national park, in designated wilderness, in a UNESCO biosphere reserve, in a place that is so special. It has all of these degrees of federal protection that are supposed to stop projects and destruction like this from occurring. This picture kind of sums it up for me. This is an organ pipe cactus that has been chopped up and bulldozed into a trash heap in order to make way for the wall. This is the exact species the organ pipe cactus national monument was designated to protect. Um, and this is what we're seeing across the borderlands. We're watching the administration destroy everything. These wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and monuments were enacted to protect simply because they're able to strong arm the agencies like the Park Service in this case into allowing wall construction to unfold on these fragile, irreplaceable lands. This is another picture um, I took, I believe this March, um, of these two beautiful ancient Suaro cactuses. Um, for people who aren't from Arizona, these are like the icons of the Sonoran Desert, these 
beautiful ancient cactuses. It takes about 75 years for them to grow even a single arm. So these two suaros that you see in this picture are probably 150, maybe 200 years old. They're almost certainly older than the border itself since it was imposed upon this landscape. Um, I was out on, on this tour with an LA Times journalist that day and I told her to take a good look at these two cactuses because they were right at the edge of the area Border Patrol was bulldozing to make way for the wall. Um, and I told her, you know, there's a good chance they might not be there for that much longer. Um, I went and I pitched a tent that night and I came back the next day at about 10 in the morning and they were gone. And I almost had that moment where you, you realize you're dreaming. You, you, you think this can't possibly be right. There's no way that these two ancient swaros could be destroyed in a matter of 12 hours. Um, but sure enough, I flipped back and forth from photo to photo and I was in the exact same spot. Um, and it was just stunning to me to see the pace of this destruction. Um, these cactuses that have lived hundreds of years just destroyed overnight to make way for the wall. Um, and we've seen hundreds and hundreds of cactuses like this be destroyed, uh, likely numbers into the thousands by now. Um, and of course, this is an ecological disaster. These cactuses are homes for, for birds, for bats, for owls, for wildlife. Uh, they stabilize the soil. And they're also deeply, deeply sacred to the optum, who view these swaros as the embodiment of their ancestors. Um, when I've been out at Oregon Pipe with my optum friends, they've described seeing these, these cactuses chopped up. I mean, it's like seeing a dead relative. It's so deeply troubling in a way that I know I will never be able to fully understand. And this is the pattern we're seeing all across Arizona. Um, this is a drone shot that we took a couple weeks ago of the Coronado National Memorial. Um, this is southeast of Tucson. Again, this is a national park unit. These are protected federal lands. And as you can see in this picture, they are quite literally blowing up a mountainside in designated critical habitat for jaguars, which are known to cross the border here um, in a national memorial. And a photo like this, I mean, this looks like a mountaintop removal operation or some sort of mining operation. Um, the damage from the wall is so much more than just the wall. It's destroying and unraveling the entire ecosystem in these areas where we're seeing construction occur. And again, this is another wildlife refuge, the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we've seen these ancient mountains just be blasted and, and bulldozed and destroyed in order to make way for a wall, um, which of course will do nothing to solve the root causes of immigration. It will push migrants further into remote areas towards their deaths. Um, and it will stop wildlife dead in their tracks. These Tinajas Altas Mountains are an important area for desert bighorn sheep to cross the border. Um, and now that a wall is going up, those migratory corridors will be slammed, closed. And of course, as Norma mentioned, the only way any of this is happening, the only way any of this is legal is because every single legal protection, every single law that applies everywhere else in this country has been cast aside to rush wall construction. That means that we're not protected in the borderlands. The Endangered Species Act does not apply here. The Clean Water Act does not apply here. The Safe Drinking Water Act does not apply here. Our communities, our wildlife, and our protected lands uh, receive no federal protection. That's all at the discretion of an unelected official, as Pedro mentioned. And of course, we're already seeing the impacts. This picture was sent to me um, about a month ago from a former colleague. This is at Oregon Pipe. Um, this is a photo of a mule deer that uh, wound up dead in the shadow of the border wall. Uh, this deer was doing what that species has evolved to do for thousands of years, wandering through the desert in the hottest month of the year in search of food, in search of water. Um, and this year, for the first time in evolutionary history, uh, this deer wound up against a landscape scale obstruction. Uh, the deer most likely wandered back and forth along the wall looking for a place to pass. Um, it was hit by probably a construction vehicle and killed. Um, and I'm, I'm sure this is a fate that many other animals are facing. I've heard accounts um, of other foxes and wildlife uh, already being found dead in the shadow of the wall. And these are stretches of wall that just went up months ago. Um, so this fragments habitat that stops wildlife migration dead in their tracks. Um, and it's just one more way in which we are unraveling these ecosystems. And if folks have been following the news last week, um, we had two incredibly courageous Otham women who actually put their bodies on the line to stop border wall construction at Oregon Pipe. Um, one of them sat in a bulldozer um, while another sat under another piece of construction 
equipment and they refuse to move. Um, and they're at Oregon Pipe, which is Hiachid, Otham, uh, ancestral land. Um, and these women were doing what the Park Service failed to do, what my old employer failed to do, which is to speak out against this travesty and to speak out to protect the cultural and natural heritage um, of these lands. Um, and it makes me absolutely sick to see uh, the Park Service actually was the, what was the agency that arrested these women. Um, and they threw them in jail for 36 hours. Um, they held them uh, without access to an attorney or a phone call. Um, I highly recommend everybody read the Intercept article that just came out um, about the arrests. I uh, will be interviews with both Nellie and Amber who were arrested at Oregon Pipe last week. They were released um, late last week, um, and now there is you know, a movement to make sure the charges are dropped. Um, this is on top of uh, an existing a uh, large scale movement in Arizona to try and stop wall construction. We've had a number of massive rallies at Oregon Pipe along the San Pedro River and throughout the borderlands uh, to draw attention to what's happening and to try and stop construction. And of course, uh, we have some major demands uh, as soon as Trump is out of office and all of this activism, all this organizing is leading up, up to us being able to, to execute these demands. Uh, number one, we want to see wall construction immediately halted as soon as Trump is out of office on day one. Number two, uh, we want to uh, remove border wall sections and wilderness areas and wildlife refuges and cultural and historic sites where they're causing the most damage. Um, and number three, we want compensation, uh, reparations effectively for the border communities, for the tribal nations that have seen so much destroyed uh, just for a vanity project. So that's my time. And like Pedro mentioned, um, I post photos and videos from the border um, every day on my Twitter account, so you can follow me there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reiken. Very, very uh, moving uh, in terms of the, the impact. And, and I think your presentation um, uh, uh, connects well. Um, it's, a, it's a nice compliment to Norma's presentation as well, because we, we see a lot of similarities. And, and in that, I think, especially considering the uh, ancestral um, lands that are being devastated, I'd like to in, invite our next speaker, Ana Gloria Marta Rodriguez. Um, and let me uh, read her uh, brief bio. Uh, Ana Gloria Marta Rodriguez uh, is Kumiai from San Jose de la Zorra. She's a member of Tipe uh, Joa International, a grassroots organization. Uh, she continues the family tradition of passing on the knowledge and expertise of the Kumiai people to the next generation, following the wishes of the elders to keep uh, their language and culture alive and vibrant. She has classes at Kumiai Cultural Nights once a month as part of her commitment to education. Uh, Mrs. Rodriguez is the interim director of the Sequan Cultural Department. She is also an instructor at Kumiai Community College, presenting classes in back basketry, pottery, and Kumiai foods. She's also assisting with Kumiai language classes and the Kumiai tools class. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Marta, for uh, joining us today. I, I've had an opportunity to uh, go to the site that's uh, under construction at this point, and it's uh, quite devastating to see, and, and, but also moving to see that at least for short periods of time, some of the blasting has been, uh, has been stopped. So Marta, uh, please, uh, um, uh, uh, please uh, present, thank you. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is um, Ana Gloria Marta Rodriguez. Thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. And then, um, so yeah, like, um, it's very disturbing to, to see a lot of the things going on right now, very sad to have to live and seeing all this um, craziness right now by the board of our communities. To all the regard to our native communities when doing this kind of projects and then with, you know, with the government waiving all the laws, um, it's very uh, sad to see all this. Um, yeah, like you guys, Pedro was talking about, you know, we are right now at the border wall fighting for, uh, you know, to, you know, to the wall, you know, they, they're, the wall is going right now to the Kumiai territory right now. Um, so for the ones you guys don't know, the Kumiai nations on both sides of this border right now, we have 
uh, 12 reservations, Kumia reservations over here in, um, in San Diego County, in the four in Baja California, North. And then, um, so yeah, one of the, the things, um, what the, the, the border wall is doing to our nation, you know, they're separating our families, um, <clears throat> breaking our relationship with our families, the plant, the animals, and then, um, and one of those, um, for us, you know, we always tell the people, especially in um, over here, you know, trying to go to the border wall and have um, kind of educate, you know, the 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 people who are working in the project over there right now, and the border patrols, you know, this is this is Kumia Nation work here since the beginning of the time, you know, and then. Um, uh, so anywhere they go into San Diego County, you will find, and then Baja, you know, will find human remains and then artifacts and stuff like that. And we have, we believe that this, you know, this is for our people. And then um, I think it's time for for us to to have those kind of conversation right now with the U.S. Mexico, with the U.S. and Mexico government. And then, uh, you know. We didn't ask for the wall. This is our, you know, this is our family. We want to be together, and then uh, so we need to 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 be united to stop all this um, desecration and be respectful for all the native nations. And then um, one, of, I don't have pictures right now of what's going on right now at the border wall, but. Um, yeah, we find human remains, and then um, you know we sue the government. They didn't pass, so I guess they're still going on. They're still working on it. And then um, I mean, we still have right now. We have brothers and sisters right now at the border wall right now, as we're speaking right now. And then uh, so um, every time we go over there, you know, we do a ceremony and. And one point we're over there, we have a ceremony with uh, with people from Baja and, and this side, we all together, all the whole community nation were together. And there was the military and then the border patrols, they were like trying to stop us to have a ceremony. And then, um, and then, uh, so yeah, they were like uh, trying to give us time and like, okay, you guys, you have like 40 minutes to finish your ceremony. And, and then uh, we said, no, we'll stop when we're, you know, when we're done. And then, uh, but this is like, this is our homeland, you know? We need to, we don't need to ask permission for these guys to tell us, oh, you have 20 minutes to do your ceremony. We're done what we're done. And then, uh, so that does very respectful for, uh, for those people to try to stop us to have our ceremonies. And then, um, so um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have any, uh, let me see. And one of the things we're doing too, especially with uh, with all the issues, you know, having our nation on both sides of the border, we have a, a um, international grassroots organization we call Tipahua. So we have people from both sides of the border. And then, uh, so we're doing a lot of st uh, stuff to help our communities. But not only just with material things, but also to be connected. You know, we have um, families that they don't see each other for years. So with this is helping us to be connected again. Um, like I say, it's time for our people, you know, to come over here to this side of the border so they can have a job, so they can live over here legally. This is their home too. And then right now, you know, we have an agreement with the uh, border patrol so they can border with a permit. And then, uh, but it's just like, we should not be asking for a permit. This is our home. It should be respected. <clears throat> I don't think I'm running out of time, right? <laughs> I don't know. You're doing fine, uh, Marta. Um, thank you so much. I, I would also ask uh, the presenters if, if um, you have uh, contact information or where um, people might be able to follow you. If, if you can uh, include that in the chat, that way they can connect with you. Um, and 
uh, the challenge, uh, and, and just to, by way of kind of providing a, a description of, of the area that Marta is talking about, it's probably about, uh, maybe about 60 miles from San Diego, uh, mm -hmm. east, going east, um, in, as Marta described, uh, terrain that's ancestral Kumeyaay lands, and without, um, and, and what the Kumeyaay there have found it is that uh, Border Patrol has, has lied in terms of uh, not providing all the information in, regarding explosives that were going to be used in, in the land to um, dig uh, up to 20 feet uh, deep um, in order to um, uh, install those 30-foot uh, barriers that Lakin had in his presentation. So it, it's uh, quite destructive work that Border Patrol is doing and that has waived uh, um, all, all sorts of laws in order to do that. And, and I, I know the legal challenge Marta has uh, recently uh, uh, did not, uh, was not favorable to the Kumeyaay, but uh, we're definitely not, not stopping and we're gonna continue to support. Thank you so much, Marta. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and so continuing, you know, we started in Texas and went to Arizona and, and uh, went to the Eastern part of San Diego County. Um, we are um, now kind of going into the Otay Mesa area and, and into the Pacific, uh, close, as close as we can get to the Pacific Ocean. I'd like to invite uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dan Watman to present next. Um, Dan is the coordinator and founder of the Binational Friendship Guardian of Native Plants inside Friendship Park at the San Diego Tijuana border. This is a, as, west, as west as you can get along the US-Mexico border. Lance, he's a Spanish teacher in San Diego and online and lives in Tijuana. He documents border wall construction in the Otay Mountains wilderness, highlighting damage to the environment and is a member of the Friends of Friendship Park, uh, which is currently working on a campaign called Build That Park that envisions converting the current Friendship Park from a militarized zone to a truly binational park. Uh, Dan, uh, take it away, please. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you, everybody. I uh, am honored and privileged to be here on this panel with everyone. I uh, am flattered and a little nervous, <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I'll, uh, like Pedro said, I'm a Spanish teacher. Uh, I've been teaching Spanish since the late 90s in, uh, in San Diego, and <clears throat> uh, the, one of the reasons I love teaching and learning languages is it gives me the opportunity, allows me to, to get to know people across cultural barriers. And <clears throat> so I'm going to share my presentation here. Um, and living in San Diego uh, over the last 20, well, actually mostly in Tijuana, living in San Diego, Tijuana region, um, uh, occupied Kumeyaay land uh, for the last <clears throat> 20 some odd years, um, in, the, in the mid at the beginning of the 2000s, I started to uh, explore around and, and, and discovered Friendship Park, and <clears throat> I just really liked the idea of being able to make friends across a literal barrier. And uh, started, uh, I brought my Spanish class to the border to do a language exchange with some friends in Tijuana, uh, and started to think of try to think of different ways to get people to come together and make friends. So we did salsa dancing lessons and yoga classes and poetry readings and uh, there's a drum circle here. And, and actually uh, we call them border encuentro events. And uh, that was the Binational Garden was actually one of those events <clears throat> back in 2007. And the, the space uh, where all this happens is called uh, Friendship Park. And uh, in, in, you could say it was uh, in, well, it kind of became called Friendship Park, you could say, when uh, Borderfield State Park was inaugurated back in August of 1971. Uh, Pat Nixon visited uh, the area. And um, <clears throat> of course, uh, Kumeyaay have migrated to the, to the region uh, for over 8,000 years, up until about 150 years ago. Um, and the picture on the right is of a, a Kumeyaay elder uh, from Juntas de Neji, east of, of Tecate, uh, Yolanda Mesa, who came uh, and, and uh, honored us with her presence to do a, a, a workshop on native flora, the use of, of, of native plants in, in our binational garden. Uh, 
um, and, the, and the space for generations has been used by families who are separated by immigration status. Um, there's a myriad of events uh, that happen sporadically at, at the park. Um, two of the probably the biggest events and, and the, definitely the biggest annual events that happen are um, the Fandango Fronterizo that, that's uh, started in 2008 and uh, the Posada Sin Fronteras, uh, which started as a reaction to uh, Operation Gatekeeper in the 90s. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so it's been going for, it's the longest uh, held uh, annual event at Friendship Park. And as the other speakers have mentioned, um, <clears throat> in I, the, there's been waivers, uh, I'm sorry, laws that have been waived in order to build these walls. And I believe if, I, if I'm, uh, maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe San Diego was the first place that um, the laws were waived in order to build border walls. Um, <clears throat> up until, uh, well, in 1994, I believe, or like some, sometime in the 90s, the, the secondary wall was built in the second, in uh, San Diego, Tijuana region, all the way up until about three and a half miles from the ocean. Um, it wasn't allowed to be continued all the way to the ocean uh, because of uh, environmental laws more than anything, but also uh, native burial acts. Um, <clears throat> and in uh, uh, the newly formed Department of Homeland Security was given uh, the, the authority to override all any and all laws in order to extend that wall uh, back in 2005. And in 2007, 2008, they implemented <clears throat> or uh, waived uh, 35, around 35 laws, 30 some odd laws. Um, including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, and uh, Lakin had a much more extensive list of, of all the laws that, that had been waived. Um, those are some of the more important ones. Um, and so, uh, of course, that wall coming in uh, threatened Friendship Park. And when the wall started to come in, uh, a, a bunch of us got together, uh, including Pedro, the American Friends Service Committee, uh, several <clears throat> organizations, environmental organizations and human rights organizations got together to try and stop the wall. We did uh, press conferences and uh, got letters from representatives uh, and uh, we documented the construction and, and just tried to spread the word about what was happening and, and nothing was stopping the wall and <clears throat> we realized it was just coming so quickly. This is way back in 2008, 2009 uh, that we should put, we decided to kind of put all our eggs in one basket and and try and save Friendship Park. And uh, <clears throat> John Fanstil, who's a, a, a pastor, a local pastor activist, now the executive director of Via International, which is the um, fiscal sponsor of uh, Friends of Friendship Park. Uh, he uh, committed himself to doing, uh, he had done uh, binational communion uh, before and he committed himself to doing it every Sunday until he was physically stopped. So our coalition, now called the Friends of Friendship Park, uh, got behind that effort. Uh, and that was our, our attempt to try and stop the wall. Um, we didn't stop the wall, but <clears throat> we made quite a spectacle and, um, and, <clears throat> and created a, a really strong coalition um, that's still together today. Uh, and we became kind of the uh, kind of the representatives of the community that talked with San Diego Border Patrol um, to try and get some type of access back to the park. Um, and this is a, just a, some of the core members of the Friends of Friendship Park. And um, when the wall came in in 2009, uh, shortly after we, uh, well, for a few years after we had a, the community had to become quite creative. On the right, there's a, 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 an event we did with a, a telescope from <coughs> a distance uh, using sign language so people, so people could continue that idea of making friends across the border. Um, the garden, although there was no uh, very little access allowed for the public uh, after the, after the uh, secondary wall came in and actually the, the garden was removed in 2008, um, we were able to replant it and actually expand it um, from a rectangular design to these, uh, to the to circles, three circles. You can see one of these circles from this kind of cool aerial shot here. And John continued to do the communions, even though um, <clears throat> even though the border church could no longer pass bread through the fence. Um, they continued to do binational 
communions during the, the short amount of short window of time that Border Patrol allowed the public into the park uh, on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And <clears throat> the picture on the left is actually from before the wall came in um, and just the tenacity of, of the community and, and the families um, <clears throat> uh, continued to, to come to the park and, and, and meet any way they could. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, there's uh, mothers, you know, every Saturday and Sunday that, that they re reunite with their son or children, uh, haven't seen them in 20 years and uh, grandparents that meet their grandchildren for the first time. And, um, so after the wall came in, this was the situation that they had in order to be able to meet. Um, you can touch pinky fingers, you can come up close and touch pinky fingers, um, or even kiss a pinky finger, uh, or you can uh, stand at a distance and be able to see each other better. So those are the kind of the options after the wall came in. And that's, that's the way it's been ever since. Um, and despite, <clears throat> despite the fact that this access was so horrible on the US side, the Mexican side, of course, was wide open. So the community continued to grow. Um, the garden was expanded and we put in uh, food, food beds, a uh, local food justice group uh, joined forces and <clears throat> we created food beds for the community. And, uh, and more and more people got involved. Uh, the border church uh, grew and became its own organization on the Mexican side. Uh, for, it's an organization to help deportees and, uh, and migrants in the region. And so on Sundays when, uh, before COVID, when uh, Border Church would have large gatherings, uh, we would harvest uh, food from the garden and, and complement the food that the church brought to the brought to Friendship Park. And <clears throat> so, like I said, uh, the garden, uh, even though there was uh, not much public access on the US side, Border Patrol was allowing uh, volunteers to come in and uh, upkeep the garden. And so it was looking very nice. It was doing, the garden was actually doing very well flourishing. Um, and <clears throat> we weren't happy with the lack of access, uh, but Border Patrol was pretty clear that, um, that there would be access allowed uh, for volunteers at least and for short uh, tours, um, but no, no public access uh, like there was before. Um, so we weren't happy about it, but at least we knew what the rules were until uh, there was just out of nowhere, unexpectedly, in January of this year, Border Patrol came in and just demolished the whole garden on the, on the US side. Um, they raised all the plants all the way to the ground, uh, about 150 native plants. They took out <clears throat> a 500 pound uh, eco bench that we had there. They uh, removed a, a sign, uh, inf heavy duty, uh, high quality informational sign about the garden that was cemented into the ground. Um, they just basically made the garden completely disappear on the US side. <clears throat> luckily, the Mexican side was still intact. And luckily also, um, <clears throat> a kind of a result of that was an outpouring of support from, from the community. Um, it was a, a devastating thing that happened to the community. And um, on the right there was kind of like a memorial that was done a few days after the half of the garden was destroyed. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the outpouring of support led to uh, media coverage and that media coverage uh, put pressure uh, along with this community support in general, uh, put pressure on border patrol and uh, they actually apologized and let us uh, replant the garden on the US side partially. Um, so native plants, as many of you probably know, are take a long time to grow. So um, the, it looks kind of funny now with these really small seedlings on the US side and these <coughs> big hardy uh, trees on the on the Mexican side, uh, but uh, at least we have something intact, uh, and uh, we continue to to work in the garden as best as we can. Um, we had right away uh, the amount of people that were coming and helping the garden increased dramatically uh, after the destruction. But then, uh, of course, uh, COVID came along, and uh, that was that came to a halt and. We had to kind of change our strategy and, and go out in small groups. Um, so we've been going out in small groups of volunteers and <clears throat> dealing with the restrictions in any way we can. We, uh, the US side is not very accessible as usual. So we, we end up watering through the fence as a picture of us of watering the plants through the fence from the Mexican side. Uh, and <clears throat> this is a, 
the 30 foot high bollard on the left there that everybody's that the other uh, presenters have been talking about. And the, the see-through one is actually 18 feet high. It doesn't look that high next to the other one, but uh, that was the wall that was put in in uh, 2000, uh, not 2007 through 2009. And <clears throat> uh, it's now in 2019, last year it was replaced with this 30 foot high wall all throughout the entire uh, San Diego Tijuana region. Uh, except for Friendship Park, but it's now, um, <clears throat> this, this shot is actually about a half a mile from the ocean, so pretty much the edge of Friendship Park. Um, and <clears throat> uh, now Friendship Park, is the, the, this 30-foot wall is now slated to come through the middle of Friendship Park within the next couple months. So the garden and, and the park in general is, is um, under threat again. Um, and <clears throat> going east, uh, that 30-foot, the the 30 foot wall um, that replaced the 18 foot wall um, happened in 2019. And then in 2017, 2018, the primary barrier, which was this kind of corrugated uh, landing mat type fencing um, that was in place, um, was replaced with the 18 foot high baller fence throughout San Diego, Tijuana. Uh, this is about three and a half miles from the ocean. They're putting in the 30 foot high wall in the background there. And <clears throat> Um, this is the, the very eastern edge of the San Diego Tijuana region uh, where they have, this is about, uh, I think, eight months ago, eight or ten months ago, they had <laughs> replaced the two barriers all the way up to the edge of San Diego Tijuana uh, region. This, and, the, and then uh, after that is the Otay Mountains. Uh, and just north of there is the open space, uh, Otay Mountain Open Space Preserve. And you can see on the, on the hillsides there the uh, grading, getting ready for the walls. And <clears throat> their, their next project uh, was to extend those walls into the Otay Mountains, uh, which they started to do. This is about six, eight months ago. Um, and this is a, a shot of <clears throat> the, the protocol is to fill the bollards with cement. So that's what this guy's doing. And um, this shot was, these shots were just a couple weeks ago at the same place um, in the beginning of Otay area, Otay Mountain Wilderness area. Um, they've already built about two to three miles of, of wall there. Um, and <clears throat> the last, this kind of section here the, on the right there, this is, that's the end of the, of where, that's where the walls did end. And now this, this was just put up within the last two or three weeks uh, to extend that going down. And they, they worked for months uh, to put that trench in, they use dynamite, and um, it's an extremely rocky terrain, and uh, it, it was just a, a, <laughs> a, a crazy engineering feat to just put a huge scar in the land and put up this uh, ridiculous uh, structure. Um, and so it's kind of a bittersweet for me to go out and hike and, and, um, and uh, document this uh, destruction because uh, in order to get out there <clears throat> in some of the areas, some of the remote areas where they're building, uh, I have to hike through, uh, I get to hike through um, some native flora and native fauna and um, this, this uh, plant on the right, this cactus is a barrel cactus. It's on the top 100 of endangered species in, in Baja California. And the, on the left is a, <clears throat> a yucca replay. And uh, this is a um, uh, California buckwheat. And <clears throat> it's a, a, a really interesting plant. It's one of the only native plants that flowers all year long uh, in the winter time. And the, when the kumiai used to migrate to this region at, at near the ocean, um, they were here in the winter months. Um, and then they would go to the east um, uh, to harvest pinions. And they, one of the signs that it was time to move east was the changing of the color of these flowers. Um, it's, it's white in the winter and then pink in the spring and then turns kind of rusty red in the summer. Um, one more plant. Uh, so uh, this um, plant this is the white sage. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, this uh, native plants in general uh, in our region have root systems that go as deep as 30 feet uh, higher than the, than the border wall. And this particular plant was planted uh, in 2011 in the Binational Garden. And despite all the plants being raised to the ground, 
I noticed uh, a couple weeks ago that this one sprouted up from those from the roots, um, despite the destruction, and <clears throat> and it really uh, for me represented those deep roots. The the root, even though it's only six inches high, the roots are at least ten feet deep, maybe as, as far as thirty feet deep, and it really represents the roots of our community and and gives me hope that uh, we can uh, create a different narrative for our region where uh, people <clears throat> people can um, come together in friendship and collaboration and uh, in harmony with the earth. And so the Friends of Friendship Park have gotten together to uh, start this campaign called Build That Park. Uh, we're supporting a, a vision uh, <clears throat> by, that was created by uh, the local architect, Jim Brown, uh, who has a design for the area with no walls um, that connects people through the fence. And the design is a rough design uh, and we'd, we've created a campaign around it um, that uh, just started it last month called Build That Park. And we're hoping that uh, in a year from now on the 50th anniversary of Friendship Park on August 18th, uh, 2021, uh, we will have gathered uh, community input and and kind of spread the word and kind of made this build that park a mantra for uh, officials and uh, and people in general in order to create that that new narrative for the border. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dan. And and uh, and just for everyone's reference, I included two links in the chat. Uh, one is to the build that park, so uh, check that out. And the other is to the. Southern Border Communities Coalition, which has a wealth of information in, in its new page called Borderlands. And so there'll, there'll be a question, someone posted a question about how Border Wall is funded. You can find some of that information there, as well as um, supporting uh, what Dan said about the first waiver authority was for uh, September of 2005 in San Diego. So you'll find all that information in the Borderlands. So check out those sites. Our next and final speaker is uh, Alejandro <coughs> Ortigosa, um, uh, who will um, share with us uh, a little bit. So let me, uh, about the work that, that he does along with his brother and a series of, of volunteers with the group called Armadillos. So I'll, I'll read uh, his bio as he sent it to me. Uh, my mother and father are from Puebla. We migrated to Mexico City at an early age. My second migration experience was a trip to this side of the border approximately 15 years ago. My brother says how to migrate a long time before me. For a long time, I've collaborated in Colectivo Mamut and learned from other groups and collectives. We saw the situation and need to support the migrant community. This vision led us to found Armadillos. For several years, we participated with other groups. The structure of Armadillos is formed from human rights and the demands of different voices. In 2015, while we participated in the Caravan 43, with many other groups and collectives, we realized that there was much to do in the migrant community everywhere. Thus, after Caravan 43 on October 26, 2015, my brother Cesar and I founded Armadillos. I thank all the people who always support us as Mahmoud Collective and now with Armadillos. And uh, the process that we're going to do is, um, uh, Alex will uh, say a, um, part of his presentation um, in Spanish, then I'll translate, and so we'll, we'll take that format um, uh, for his presentation. Uh, Alex, uh, adelante, por favor. Hola, buenas, buenas tardes a todas, a todos. Eh, muchísimas gracias por, por el espacio, Pedro. Muchísimas gracias a, a todas ¿no? por sus experiencias, por sus pláticas que se están llevando a cabo. Eh, reconocemos que siempre se, se está aprendiendo de, de las voces, de la gente, de las experiencias, pero más que nada pues de los, de los sueños, ¿no? de los anhelos que tenemos todas y todos por un mundo mejor. Eh, nosotros ah, hemos participado eh, en la comunidad y vemos la gravedad de, del muro, de las fronteras. Eh, lo vimos, ah, podemos ver la gravedad de la, de la actitud del, de, de la policía, ¿no? de, de la migra. Lo vimos con Anastasio Hernández, ¿no? el compa que fue eh, asesinado. A él lo golpearon. Eh, y a pesar de que él gritaba que, que, que por auxilio ¿no? No, no se le brindó esa ayuda y tres días después de que lo golpearon, pues eh, él falleció en el hospital. Lo vemos día a día, ¿verdad? Con, con toda la eh, 
vaya con todo lo que hace la policía, ¿verdad? Eh, tenemos varios casos eh, documentados por algunas otras personas, eh, pues llámese los compas de Unión del Barrio, ¿verdad? Con quienes también hemos participado. Gracias, Alex. Déjame uh, seguir. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for the space and thank you for the experiences that you have shared. Thank you for the um, presentations that you've provided. We recognize that uh, learning takes place and has to take place uh, by and from everyone. Uh, we have uh, participated in the gravity uh, of the situation. Um, uh, and, and what comes to mind is the case of Anastasio Hernandez Rojas um, of 10 years ago, despite the fact that he called for help, he didn't receive assistance. And so we see this call for help everywhere, um, especially now with uh, what the police does. Ourselves, we have several cases that we have documented and in our work in collaboration with various groups, including the work of Unión del Barrio, there's a lot of work that we've been collaborating with uh, other organizations. Y sí, bueno, también uh, eh, la, la principal intención nuestra de, de Armadillos, pues es darle, darle nombre a, los, a las personas que tratan de venir para, para este otro lado de, de, pues vaya, de este territorio ocupado, ¿verdad? Entonces, uh, nosotros lo que hacemos es ir eh, dos veces por mes, es lo que estamos tratando de hacer, de salir dos meses por mes, dos veces por mes, perdón, eh, para buscar cuerpos, para buscar cuerpos de la gente que, que se queda en el camino. Nuestra intención es encontrar gente viva, pero lamentablemente la mayor de las veces encontramos cuerpos. Eh, nosotros y nosotras como, como grupo, como grupo consciente, sabemos como les comentaba que ellos tienen nombre, ellos tenían sueños, dejaron familias, ¿verdad? Eh, nosotros lo que hacemos eh, es ir a buscarlos y una vez que los encontramos, eh, pues llevamos cruces, llevamos cruces. De hecho, eh, nos estamos preparando porque va a haber una salida el día de mañana. Nosotros eh, como trabajadores tenemos a, pues vaya un horario regular entre semana y cuando salimos es los días viernes para tratar de, pues de llevar Llevar estas cruces, como les comentábamos, como les comentaba. Esta foto es del señor José. A este señor le llevamos una cruz hace dos meses. A él se le, se le encontró debajo de, de un puente. Lamentablemente, cuando se encontró y llegó el cuerpo forense, nos dijeron que el señor tenía entre una hora y 45 minutos de haber muerto, lo cual es bastante grave, ¿verdad? Y entonces es cuando nosotros uh, nos damos cuenta que en realidad eh, quienes están cobrando estas vidas no es el desierto, ni el sol, ni lo malo del terreno que tengan que, que cruzar, ¿verdad? Sino más que nada son las fronteras, las fronteras que son construidas por el hombre, ¿verdad? Y pues vaya, lamentablemente son quienes están cobrado, cobrando la vida, ¿verdad? De, de muchísima gente, porque en su intento de venir para este otro lado, entonces ellos uh, tienen que buscar nuevas rutas, nuevas rutas para poder llegar a este lado con, con su familia. Eh, eh, hemos visto gente que ha sido deportada, entonces en el intento de regresar con su familia, pues ha perdido la vida. Y es bastante grave todo esto que está pasando. Adelante, compa Pedro. Uh, also, the main reason uh, of Armadillos is to give names to the people who attempt to cross to this side of the border, the occupied territory. We go twice a month to look for bodies, um, bodies of people who have been lost or who have lost their way. Our intention is to find people alive, but unfortunately, we find bodies. They have names, they had dreams, they left their families behind. We look for them, and once found, we place crosses where we find them. When we go out, mainly on Fridays, we attempt, attempt to take uh, crosses. So for instance, this photo is a photo of Jose. Uh, we took a cross uh, uh, two months ago. We found his body under a bridge. When the forensics arrived, they told us that it had just probably been about an hour to an hour and 45 minutes of his death. We realized that those who are dying 
uh, are dying because of the cost, and that's the cost of, of border walls because people have to attempt to cross through new routes uh, when they cross into the US to be with their families. Many of these individuals are recently deported people. Yeah. Hay, hay un caso que, que tenemos muy, muy cercano. Eh, ella era una, era un vecino nuestro y digo, era porque él falleció eh, en su intento, como comentaba, de, de regresar a este otro lado con, con su familia. Él salió una tarde a comprar leche, él salió a la tienda y ya no regresó. Ya no regresó porque los, lo agarraron la, eh, los agentes del ICE en la tienda, se lo llevaron, su familia no sabía nada. Eh, cuando supieron ya lo habían deportado. Entonces, como comentaba hace un momento, él es, en su intento de regresar nuevamente con su familia, falleció en el desierto. Y ese, eh, son casos bastante lamentables, eh, bastante, do, bastante dolorosos, ¿verdad? Eh, como les comentaba, eh, en el 2017, nosotros salimos al, al desierto. Siempre, como les comentábamos, salimos con la mejor intención de, de encontrar gente viva para poder ofrecerles a, pues los primeros auxilios, darle ayuda humanitaria. En esa ocasión nosotros encontramos unos restos, eh, pues sí, vaya, no, no, no sabemos cuánto tiempo tenían ahí, pero lo raro es que cuando nosotros reportamos estos restos, a nosotros nos dijeron que habían recogido los restos para, las, para hacerle todo el proceso de sangre y para hacerle todos los estudios pertinentes para saber eh, de, quién, de quién son esos restos nosotros entregamos información a, a las autoridades. Las autoridades se comunicaron con mi hermano César dos días después y le dijeron que ya habían levantado los restos. Pero resulta que el año pasado, en el 2019, algunos otros compañeros de otro grupo que están de base en Arizona encontraron estos mismos restos. Lo cual quiere decir que a las autoridades no les, no le, no les interesan, vaya, los... La, 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 las cosas que nosotros podamos encontrar, los restos en este caso, ¿no? Posiblemente y porque no les generamos dinero, ¿no? Como, eh, por ejemplo, se encuentra una persona viva y se lo llevan a, a, a un centro de detención, ellos van a obtener dinero por medio de, del castigo, ¿no? De, de, de lo que les paga el gobierno a ellos por hacer su supuesto trabajo, ¿no? Eh, entonces, ah, lo que digo es que a ellos no le, no le, interesa, no le interesan nuestros huesos, ¿no? Nuestros restos. Porque a ellos les genera un gasto hacer todo, el, todo el, el papeleo, todos los estudios, exámenes de ADN. Entonces todo eso eh, creemos que es lo que ellos no quieren, ¿no? Gastar en todo, en todo lo que a ellos les genere gastos. Es, es, es bastante triste. Hemos tenido pues bastantes malas experiencias. Hemos también tenido algunas muy, muy, a, vaya que nos llenan de, de satisfacción. Eh, hace eh, posiblemente... Un mes encontramos a un muchachito, veníamos eh, ya de regreso para casa, ya veníamos después de una búsqueda y nos habló una persona, un contacto y nos dijo que eh, le había llegado un reporte que un muchachito estaba perdido en Jacumba. Eh, fue, digamos, como una señal, como suerte, porque eh, los compañeros que habían salido en esa ocasión venían de regreso y precisamente faltaba poco, como unos 30 minutos para llegar a Jacumba. Afortunadamente, pues, se puede encontrar a este muchachito con vida. Con vida, entonces, son de las pocas experiencias que podemos eh, llenarnos de, de satisfacción de, de esto que estamos haciendo, de, ser, de sentirnos bien con nosotros y nosotras mismas, ¿no? De, de saber que estamos en el camino correcto. Entonces, ah, pues, este muchachito, pues, ya estaba bastante lastimado. Tenía bastantes días ya caminando. Sus tenis, pues, ya se habían reventado de, de, de la de tanto calor, de las piedras que se tienen que venir a, eh, cruzando ¿no? en, el, en el camino. Entonces, pues sí, estaba bastante lastimado. El muchachito pidió que se, que se comunicara a uno con las autoridades para que él pudiera pues, llevar a cabo el proceso y poder regresar con su familia. Sí, compa Pedro. Uh, so there, uh, there's a case that I wanna, uh, that's very close to us. This person was a neighbor of ours. He died trying to cross. He left his uh, family to go buy milk at a, at a local store and he never returned. We later find out that ICE detained him and he was taken away and his family didn't know anything. Uh, so in his attempt to return to his family, he died in the desert. 
Uh, we had an experience in 2017. We always go out with the intent of finding people alive, but during this time, what we found were the remains of, of somebody. We reported the remains to the authorities and they told us that the remains had been picked up. Um, under, over all the information to the authorities about location and things of that nature. Um, again, they told us that the remains had been picked up, but another group out of Arizona that does similar work to ours uh, recently found the remains in the same area. So this, the same remains that we had already re reported had not been picked up. To the authorities, uh, they are not interested in the remains because what we find is uh, they don't generate money. If we find someone that's alive, then perhaps what will happen is that they will detain that person place them in a detention center, and they'll make money off of that person. They'll profit off, the, off of that detention. Finding remains will cost them money. It means they'll have to spend money on the DNA uh, tests and other, and other sorts of um, investigations. We've had a difficult experiences, but we've also had some promising uh, experiences that leave us with a lot of satisfaction. About a month ago, we got a call about someone that was lost in Hakumba. We found a young man in that search and left us with a lot of satisfaction to know that we are on the right path. That boy was tired, he was injured, his shoes were completely torn, uh, but he, he asked us uh, to turn him over to the authorities for him to return with his family. Sí, um, nosotras, nosotros pues hemos participado eh, bastante tiempo con la comunidad, conocemos de la necesidad de la comunidad, ¿no? y la comunidad pues espera que en algún momento haya justicia para, para sus familiares. Eh, estamos uh, pues al 100% con la comunidad. Eh, ahorita se han hecho pues bastantes esfuerzos eh, eh, y también uh, pues es, es muy bueno también a pesar de, de todo esto del COVID, pues se siguen haciendo esfuerzos, se siguen visitando a los centros de detención, por ejemplo en Otay, con las compas, con los compas de, de Freedom O, se han hecho acciones para, para estar ahí, también los compas de American Friends han estado haciendo bastantes acciones ahí en En, este, en el centro de detención de Otay. Y es, es muy bueno que nosotras, nosotros nos, nos, nos esforcemos un poco por, por una mejoría para todas, para todos. Eh, es, pues solamente me queda agradecerles a, a todas ustedes, a todos por, por escuchar. Muchas gracias también por permitirnos aprender de todas y de todos. Y pues de mucho corazón les decimos, nosotros nos estamos preparando hoy precisamente Eh, pues ya hicimos, ya hicimos unas cruces, vamos a ir a buscar a una persona que está perdida y también eh, vamos a ir a dejar una cruz el día, este fin de semana para otra persona que ya fue localizada, eh, ya mandamos a hacer la fotografía, ya tenemos la cruz pintada eh, y pues bueno, pues lamentablemente tenemos que hacer esto, pero lo de las cruces lo hacemos precisamente para, para honrar para honrar su camino de estas personas que no pudieron llegar a este lado o que no pudieron reunirse nuevamente con su familia, pues les agradecemos mucho. Vamos a seguir haciendo este tra este trabajo por por todo el tiempo que sea necesario. Y pues como decimos siempre, ¿verdad? y como dice mucha mucha gente, nosotros no cruzamos el bordo, el bordo eh, la frontera nos cruzó a nosotros. ¿Verdad? Muchísimas gracias, compas. Eh, les agradecemos por este por este espacio. Muchas gracias, Pedro y Pues seguimos en la lucha con paz. Gracias. Gracias, Alex. Uh, so finally, uh, Alex says we have participated with a lot with a lot of community efforts. We know what the needs are in the community. We hope there will be justice with the families. Right now, there's a lot of um, actions and efforts going on in spite of uh, the COVID pandemic. There are actions that are taking place at the Otay Mesa Detention Center with the Freedom All campaign, with AFC, and with a lot of other organizations. Uh, that are taking place and it's important that we take action to support everyone. Thank you all for listening and for your teachings as well. We are preparing to leave this weekend, uh, to, leave, uh, to um, leave another cross with another photograph of a person that was lost in the desert. Sadly, this is something that we have to do, but it's to honor their past since they were not able to meet with their family and we will continue to do this as long as it's necessary. Um, as the saying goes, we then cross the border, the border crossed us. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Alex, por todo el esfuerzo de los compañeros con Armadillos. Thank you, Alex, for all the effort and the work that Armadillos does. I know that we have short two minutes. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, checking in with uh, Laura, see if we can do maybe maybe one question. I, I know that's kind of unfair, 
uh, but um, I think the presentations spoke for themselves. Um, and uh, Laura, if you want to chime in to see if we want to do uh, questions or if we want to um, uh, maybe uh, end it here, uh, you're on mute, Laura. Uh, no, Pedro, go ahead. If there's questions, we should take them. If those that need to leave, they should, you know, they can go ahead and leave. But uh, before they leave, I do want to say that we have our next uh, panel on October 1st. So please put it in your calendars. We're going to be going to uh, Tijuana and Mexicali and Calexico, Tijuana and San Isidro. So no, let's take some questions. So if you can post your questions on the chat, I, I see, and, and just for our panelists, I know that we were scheduled to end right now at 5.30. So if you have to go, that's completely understandable. If you can spend another 10 minutes with us, then we'd be truly grateful for that as well. Um, any questions? Um, seen a lot of uh, people thanking the panelists. Uh, great job, everyone. Um, maybe a couple of questions if you have any. Or maybe not. <laughs> ah, um, una pregunta, uh, Alex, ¿cómo podemos apoyar el trabajo eh, de, de Alejandro y su grupo y armadillos? Sí, uh, muchísimas gracias por, por preguntar. Nos, eh, nosotros en la página tenemos un, una, un GoFundMe eh, y también hay un Bemo en la misma página nuestra de, de armadillos. Eh, y pues eh, solamente esos son los, es, esas son las formas. Este dinero se está ocupando para distintas cosas, por ejemplo, para las salidas cuando vamos a Arizona. Eh, ahorita también estamos haciendo un trabajo binacional. Entonces también eh, ocupamos pues, el dinero para algunas cosas que se llevan para México, para herramientas, eh, porque sabemos que es muy necesaria también la labor en México, porque no descartamos que también algunas personas que se estén encontrando en México sean migrantes. Entonces, muchísimas gracias por, por su apoyo. Y sí, ahí están los links en, en nuestra página de, de Armadillos. Voy ¿Y a... Alex, esa página es en Facebook? Eh, sí, eh, la página se llama Armadillos Busca y Rescate. Y tenemos otra en Instagram que se llama Armadillos Oficial NUM. Así, N-U-M-M, -M, Armadillos Oficial NUM. Ya son las páginas. Okay, muy bien. I'll, I'll try to post those. So essentially, they do have a GoFundMe and a Venmo, and the, the funds go to support their work uh, for a lot of the tools they, they use and for the excursions out uh, that, you know, do cost a lot of money uh, for their vehicles and for gas and things. So I'll try to see if I can find the, um, the Facebook uh, post to place a link. So another question, um, for those of us that don't live nearby, what can we do from afar to support your work on the border? And I uh, imagine this would be open for any of the panelists. Going to buildthatpark.org would be really helpful for, for our movement. There's a petition online that you can sign. And there's also an intake form uh, where we're asking people to share what their vision is for a truly binational park. Thank you, Dan. And I just reposted that link on the chat. Um, the question you, is uh, when and where will this recording be posted? <clears throat> and that's probably more of a question for Laura and Bob. Bob? Yeah, it will be posted uh, uh, soon on the People's Tribune and Tribuno de Pueblo websites. We'll have links to them there. Great. Um, there's a question for uh, Marta. Are there any rallies, organized events we can get involved in, support the Kumeyaay people in the broader San Diego region? Uh, yeah, uh, we have several ones. Uh, if you guys want more information about it, you guys can go on Facebook and they call Warriors Awareness. That's when they post usually the rallies or any kind of events and stuff like that. And then, um, so yeah, just go on Facebook and just put Warriors Awareness. Uh, sometimes it's Warriors Awareness topics or something that they post 
um, when um, when they have action to go to the border or they have like any you know events at San Diego things they post it in there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, Facebook open, so I can't post uh, information from Facebook around. It takes a lot of uh, a lot of energy from the computer, so it would probably shut me down if I open it at the same time. But please do look up those uh, 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 recommendations on on Facebook. Um, let's see. Uh, question from uh, Maggie: What are the major coalition national organizations to follow? Should be rid ourselves of a plague in the federal administration in November to raise up the voices of the border for the new administration. Um, great, thank you for posting. Um, my suggestion in that sense, and I, I did post the uh, Southern Border Communities Coalition, but as you, as you know, a lot of the organizations here who presented are local. Uh, so definitely follow the local org so you get a better sense of um, what the feeling is on the ground um, and how to support that effort locally from all the way from the RGD when uh, Norma presented uh, to uh, coming all the way to, to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And Pedro, can you hear me? Yes. Pedro. Oh. Yes, and I, I also wanna say that we need to get Trump out of office. It is so important that we do that because he's destroying not only the environment, he's destroying lives and it, does our vote does matter, especially in this election. So we, the reason we did it, we're doing these panels is to bring awareness of what he has done to the immigrant community, the migrant community and the border so that we, we can get that man out of office. He does not deserve to be there. Uh, you know, the latest thing that we have heard is the, the women having hysterectomies in the detention center in Georgia. And that's under his watch. I mean, you know, maybe he didn't do it directly, but it's his policies, it is his rhetoric, and, and all the venom that he just foams out of his mouth. So we really need to get him out of office and try to talk to everyone we can to convince them that this time our vote does count. Because a lot of people don't vote. So we need, we have a lot of work to do before November 3rd. I might have missed. Uh, there's a question of how many people uh, die in their attempts to cross on a yearly basis. Um, that number could be anywhere between three to 500 people um, of human remains that have been found. Um, there's a higher number of people that are just not accounted for. Uh, so it's definitely uh, probably higher than that. And uh, the Rochelle posted, no matter who is elected, we still need to fight to hold elected officials accountable. Both parties have done irreparable harm to our immigrant communities. Um, yes. That's true. I think part of the, the idea of talking about border wall is that a lot of the border wall was uh, already in place before Trump took office. And we know that Biden has Biden, uh, voted for border wall back when he was a uh, senator. Uh, so, um, you know, we have to hold everyone accountable as, as Kathy uh, reiterated there in, um, on the chat. Um, so I, I do want to honor the, the time that people have and, and not take more time. Let's see, there's a, maybe we can take this as a final question. Um, uh, Texas and Arizona are contested states for those working in those states. To what extent are these issues around which we organize to contribute to existing efforts? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, I think in Arizona, there's something very, very personal uh, about seeing these faro cactuses bulldozed and chopped up. I mean, it's like an attack on our, our state's icon, our state's pride. Um, and when you look at polling data from Texas, from New Mexico, from Arizona, um, you have the majority of people in those states against building more border walls. Um, so I think public opinion has shifted. It's come a long way since, um, you know, the Secure Fence Act passed more than 10 years ago. Um, and I think now the more attention we can bring to this issue, the more we can show people the true cost of walls and militarization, the more we can invigorate people to come out and vote in November. So I definitely think it's it's serves a solid purpose to keep uh, sharing these stories in terms of voter turnout. Okay. 
Great. Thank you. And um, Alex, nomás para asegurar, eh, la página que acabo de poner de GoFundMe es la correcta. So I'm just asking Alex if, if the link to the GoFundMe is the correct one for Armadillos. Deja Checo, ¿está en los mensajes? Sí. Uh, Well, while he finds the, <laughs> the information, I really want to thank everyone, in, uh, all the panelists, Dan and Laken, Norma, Ana Gloria, Alejandro, and of course, uh, Pedro, our facilitator and organizer and coordinator of this panel. So I think he did a great job of pulling everything together. And so thank you, all of you. No me aparece nada, compa. Yo tampoco la veo, Pedro. Okay, let me, let me, let me try again. Um, if you uh, want information uh, in the next panel, uh, type in your email so we can uh, get a hold of you again. If you're interested. I just put the GoFundMe again. Hopefully that, that's the correct one. La, la volví a poner, Alex. Mm -hmm. Sí, ah, sí, al parecer sí es esta. Sí, sí es esta. Okay, muy bien. Uh, so we'll leave, um, uh, this, this concludes the panel. Thank you so much. We'll leave it open so that uh, folks can place in their uh, emails. Um, be on the lookout for more information. A very special thank you to all the panelists. I know you're very busy. Uh, yeah. Lincoln, uh, uh, had the week off, so he was on vacation. So uh, grateful for you as well. Uh, for Marta, I'm sure I'll get to meet you at some point here in San Diego. Norma, thank you. Dan, gracias. Alex, gracias. Um, y pues a todos, all of you for participating on this uh, this evening, this afternoon. Um, it's been a, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Gracias a ti. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.